Hey guys, Theophilus Most Excellent here, and thanks for tuning in to the latest video. And in this one, I actually want to start a new series where I address Bible passages that are renowned for giving Christians a hard time. As in, at first glance, the Christian might think there's a contradiction or a problem with that passage that causes them to ultimately just trust God's word in general. And so I actually want to address these kinds of passages and show that they're not problems at all for Christians. And on top of that, I hope you'll see that my answers to these kinds of issues are better and more reasonable than most responses you're going to come across that are really just very shallow. And this isn't because I'm some kind of super genius or something like that. It's probably because I really hate shallow answers. I mean, it's like putting a band-aid on a bullet wound, you know? And as Christians, we follow him who called himself the truth. And so if we want to honor Christ, we'll try our best to respect his truth and not belittle him by giving unreasonable answers to people he cares about. And so I want to give compelling answers here that help you guys get past these apparent Bible problems. And so for the first one, I actually want to address Judges 1.19. And the verse says, And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain, because they had chariots of iron. So some people point to this verse as proof that the God of the Old Testament is not omnipotent. And omnipotent means all-powerful. And as you can see in these verses on the screen, the Bible elsewhere teaches God is definitely all-powerful. So then they'll say, why does it seem here in Judges 1 as though God lacked the ability to defeat the chariot-wielding Canaanites? Because a lot of skeptics are going to hear this kind of verse and think it's evidence that the ancient author of Judges just didn't believe in an all-powerful God, but that that belief about God evolved later on. And so here they take this as though the Israelites were simply saying their God was overpowered by iron chariots because he was merely some kind of tribal deity that could be thwarted by such things, you know? And because iron chariots were the strongest weapon the Israelites were aware of, I guess in the minds of these skeptics, they think that means that the Israelites thought that their God was susceptible to them in some way. And so how do we resolve this issue? Well, we can start by pointing out that if one looks carefully at this verse, it's actually Judah who could not defeat the Canaanites with iron chariots, not God. That is, the he that said not to be able to drive out is a reference to the tribe of Judah. And this is because Judah is the closest antecedent, not the Lord. So he, here in the verse, would refer to Judah. I mean, think about the second part of the sentence here. Does God take possession of the hill country, or would that be Judah? Obviously, that's Judah, because God charged Judah to take possession of the land of Israel just like this. So then the he in this part refers to Judah, and so logically, the next he also refers to Judah as well. I mean, the subject isn't going to change from one breath to the next without some kind of indication in the text. And not to mention, in context, verses 17 and 18 were also about Judah capturing Canaanite land. And so the subject of the land capturing undoubtedly remains Judah here in verse 19 as well. And also there's the fact that many Bible translators supply the word they here to speak about the subject of this verse, rather than he. They can do this because the word he or they isn't really original to the Hebrew. They're actually just supplied to make sense of the verse in English. So these translators are simply trying to make clear to the reader that the subject here is the people of Judah and not the Lord. They works perfect for this since it would refer to the many people that make up the tribe of Judah, but it couldn't really be confused with the singular Lord from the beginning of the verse. And you can also see in C.J. Ellicott's commentary for English readers that he says the Hebrew actually avoids naming the subject of who failed in the driving out here, and instead it literally says, quote, there was no driving out, unquote. So the Hebrew here is more ambiguous than what we find in our English translations, and it can't really be pinned on God specifically like that. But still though, even if the subject is Judah, some would still argue that God's failure to lead Judah to victory is a proof that he lacks power. But really that would be to demand more of God's omnipotence than what is meant by the term omnipotence. To say God has to do something to be all-powerful is not how omnipotence works. God isn't required to always exercise his omnipotence. He can leave Israel to fail as he sees fit, as he's done in the past, like in the Exodus narrative or in Joshua when they begin capturing the land. 
In these events where God allows Israel to fail, he does those kinds of things to punish Israel or to teach them a lesson or even to point out the necessity of their faith in him alone. And so this event here in Judges 1 would be pretty typical of the Israelites who were constantly in dread over the military might of their enemies, even though they had a God who was all-powerful on their side. I mean, think back to Israel's refusing to go up and take the land to begin with because there were giants in it. That didn't imply a weakness in God, but a lack of faith on Israel's part that actually caused God to abandon them to the attacks of the Canaanites soon after that. And that was God's punishment on them for being faithless in that particular event. And the same thing is almost certainly happening here. I mean, Judah fears the chariots, and so they refuse to go up and face them. And this, and other failures to take the land in this chapter, is probably why God starts off Judges chapter 2 by rebuking Israel for refusing to take the land that he had promised to give them if only they be faithful to him. And so you see, the element of weakness here is not God, it's man. Israel refuses to get over their fear, place their faith in God, and go do what he has commanded them, just like they've done so many times before. And ultimately, God has a reason for showing this kind of weakness and failure of man in Scripture. It's to show that where man is involved in saving himself, he always fails, thus showing the necessity of relying on God alone for salvation. This is a continuous theme in the Old Testament. God is over and over trying to show the failures of mankind in an attempt to expose their need for him as Savior. And this ultimately culminates in God becoming the man, Christ Jesus, and bearing the entire burden of man's salvation on his own shoulders. That's the gospel of salvation. And so God in the Old Testament is priming mankind, trying to open his eyes to the necessity of this gospel, wherein God is the only Savior. But even beyond all this, I have to point out the utter hypocrisy of this argument about God being weak because he can't defeat some iron chariots. The reason this argument is truly absurd is because this very same author in the very same book will in just a few chapters describe how the Lord, not Judah, destroys an entire Canaanite army of iron chariots. And so it's a massive oversight for someone to argue here that God isn't omnipotent because he can't defeat some iron chariots if in the same exact text, he does defeat Iron Chariots. And really, this also just shows that the people making this kind of argument are just cherry picking and probably haven't actually studied the entire book of Judges or the Old Testament for any kind of context any further than just simply Googling Bible contradictions or something like that. Which if you think about it, anyone could create a supposed contradiction in any written text if they ignore context and leave out parts here and there to suit their argument. And so I hope this video was ultimately a blessing to you and that if you had previously struggled with this passage, that this video resolved the issue for you. And if you're a Christian who has another problem passage you'd like me to cover, tell me about it in the comments section and I might actually make a video about it. I mean, I'd recommend you visit my playlist section before you comment though because I actually have an entire playlist entirely devoted to Bible difficulties just like this one, which I'll link to in the description. So look through that and see if you can find the answer there first and if not, hit me up I guess. And also I just want to really quickly remind you guys of my backup channel, Christian Video Vault. And I actually put out a video on there every Saturday afternoon, what I've come to call the CVV Saturday Evening Post. So check that out and subscribe for more content from me more often. Also, YouTube has recently unlocked the community feature for me. So I always post the link to the CVV Saturday Evening Post on there. So be sure to check out the community tab on my channel, interact with the videos and stuff that I post on there. You know, leave some comments, thumbs up the content you like and I'm actually going to be putting a poll on there so you guys can go vote on what you like my next main project to be. So some of the potentials are a video about how Gnosticism is the religion of the Antichrist, a real crazy one about zombies in the Bible, one about the angel of the Lord, and another about identifying who the 144,000 of the book of Revelation are, or just an entire series of shorter videos working through each chapter of the book of Revelation and doing my best to explain the harder to understand stuff. And that way I'd be covering like half of those topics I just listed in like a shorter amount of time, plus a lot more stuff really. And so if I get like, let's say over a hundred total votes for one particular candidate in like less than a month, I'll go with that option for my next big project. And so if you liked one of those ideas, make sure that you go on the Theophilus Most Excellent Community tab and vote for the one you want, or you may never end up actually seeing it. 
Also, you're probably going to want to enable the videos and posts feature at the top of your subscription list to see community posts like that in your subscription feed. Otherwise, you're probably never going to see that kind of post from me unless you specifically remember to go back and check the community tab every Saturday, which, let's be honest, that's pretty tedious and annoying. So it's way easier to just have it show up in your subscription feed. But that's my spiel, guys. I just want to thank you guys for checking out the video and for all the love you've shown my channel over the years. I love you guys very much. and. As always, Godspeed.